So a very warm welcome to everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to participants from the continent. Today we have our 31st webinar in our knowledge series of the Indian EU ICT standardization collaboration project, which is in partnership with TSDSI, uh, India's SDO and ETSI, the European Standards Organization. Today's topic is on standardization, uh, standardizing smart lifts with the transition to IoT. The discussions would explore different aspects of cybersecurity and standardization in the lift sector and how standardization and monitoring in the digital era can support the integration of the so-called smart lifts. Taking into due consideration the most recent developments of the market in the Internet of Things age. <clears throat> in the presentation would show how standardization is evolving and adapting to the latest developments in the digital market, which is constantly changing and updating itself. So we have with us today four very eminent speakers. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator today, Mr. Aurindam Bhattacharya. He's a group leader at CDOT and vice chair of the 1M2M Marcom subcommittee at CDOT. He's been with CDOT since 1993 and has been the solution architect for various projects of CDOT like intelligent networks, data clearing house, uh, OSS and centralized monitoring systems, amongst a host of other uh, projects and solutions. Currently leading the activities of IoT, M2M communication in CDOT, he has been an advocate of standardization of the M2M IoT communication and is participating and contributing actively in the one M2M international standardization body on IoT, M2M, and also in smart infrastructure. I also have the pleasure and privilege of introducing to you uh, our three eminent panelists. Uh, Mr. Enrico Scarron is from Telecom Italia Mobile, and he joined the R&D division of TIM in 1992. He is currently the chairman of the steering committee of 1M2M representing Etsy, and the chairman of Etsy technical committee for Smart M2M. He is the standardization manager in charge of the coordination for IoT M2M standardization in the TIM group. Um, he's been involved a lot with 3GIP and 3GPP, and he was involved in several projects in technology planning and section testing, budget forecasts, RFI, RFQ in the mobile and FMC areas, developing a strong link between real networks and standardization research. This includes technical consulting on mobile, fixed, and IMS technologies in more than 15 countries around the world in Asia, South America, and Europe. He has been extensively engaged in 3GPP, including SA and RAN3, and in particular in SA1, dealing with service and operational requirements, mobile systems, where he served as chairman from 2006 to 2011. He was deeply involved in the foundation of Etsy TC M2M, where he served as chairman for, from 2011 to 2012. And he was one of the major people stimulating the creation and uh, <clears throat> the creation of one to m in charge of developing a global multi-service system for IoT communications. Welcome, sir. And we have with us also Mr. Marco Colliati uh, from Tree SCRL, who's a senior designer of lift systems and is the Director of Research, Design, and User Experience of Tree SCRL, as well as Managing Director of the Tree Engine SRL. He's referent in the Italian UNI C2 CTO 19 Technical Committee and a member of many concerned working groups. He's an F FSME expert, as well as member of the FSME Digital Working Group and member of the Technical Commission of Etsy, TC uh, Smart, uh, Etsy Technical Committee for Smart M2M, as SBS expert. He is also a lecturer and speaker in the technical normative field with experience gained in trade associations, notified bodies, and universities. And lastly, but not least, is Dr. Mauro Dragoni. In, uh, he's a research scientist at the Fonzione Bruno Kessler. I hope I've got that uh, pronunciation right. Within the Digital Health Research Center, his main research topics concern knowledge management, information retrieval, and machine learning by focusing on the development of real-world prototypes as outcome for his research activities. He's been involved in a number of international and industrial research projects, and he has co-authored co more than 140 scientific publications in international journals, conferences, and workshops, 
and he started to collaborate with Etsy in 2019 by working on the design of Saref extensions conceptual models, and he will be talking to us on some of those today. Um, at the end of the session, uh, there will be a question and answer session, which would be uh, moderated by uh, Orindam. And uh, there would be a recording of this session also, which we would upload to YouTube and to our website. And that would be available to all. Thank you. With that, I hand over to you, Arindam. Thank you very much, Arun. I'm really delighted to actually act as a moderator for this particular session. Uh, we have come a long way since we began our work with 1M2M uh, standardization of IoT in India. As you all uh, must be knowing and be delighted to know that, that 1M2M is now a national standard in India. Uh, as far as IoT communication is concerned from uh, Department of Telecommunications standpoint and also from Bureau of Indian Standards standpoint. Uh, currently, it's uh, release two, which has been adopted as the national standard. And very soon we will see release three also becoming uh, the national standard over here. That's a natural progression. Now, today's topic uh, is very, very relevant in, uh, in, in the current world because as we see more and more uh, uh, I mean, urbanization taking place and the city landscape is uh, now uh, getting taller as uh, it was earlier getting broader. So smart lift is uh, certainly a necessity. Uh, I mean, it, it almost can be seen as a transport within a building. So uh, the smartness of the lift, which was, uh, I mean, maybe a decade ago was uh, unheard of and uh, untalked about uh, becomes a absolute necessity and reality in today's time. And whenever uh, there's something which actually touches lives, IoT in today's world become the, the, the commonplace and the necessary part of every technology area and every walk of life uh, that we can think of and uh, lifts are not going to be untouched uh, by that. I'll not take much time uh, in doing that because we have such eminent speakers to listen to. Uh, so I would request uh, Enrico, who's a dear friend, and <laughs> know him since uh, quite a few years now, uh, would uh, uh, perhaps uh, start his talk uh, and uh, enlighten everyone uh, with his knowledge and uh, what he has in store up his sleeve. Uh, over to Enrico, thank you. Thank you very much, Arinda. So I will take the screen for a little introduction uh, of, a, of, a, of a day of today. And then we will go to the more deep presentation that we have prepared. But let's uh, try to start. Let's see if I can, okay. Uh, share. So first of all, it's a big honor to be invited to share this experience, which those we all think uh, uh, is uh, very valuable and uh, is getting uh, worldwide value, even we started in Europe. But uh, let me um, drive you a little bit in, uh, in, in this work. First thing, uh, you know what is EXIF, so I'm not going really to stress uh, again the information about EXIF, but there are a few information which are very important for this, specifically for this smart lift discussion. The first thing is that, uh, uh, that I'd like to remember of EXIF is that uh, in Europe we have three standard organizations recognized by the European Union, and uh, they are Sense Senelec and Etsy. What it means? What it means essentially that Etsy can prepare specification which become a European norm, can become European norm. So we can make standards as Etsy, uh, which can be applied on a voluntary basis, or we can make an even norm which can become uh, really mandatory to be implemented by the different national nation in Europe. Uh, after, of course, a process of national approval. Second thing which I'd like to remind, still talking about the fact that uh, in Europe we have these uh, three standard organizations which work together, that 
uh, some years ago, the borderline between these three organizations was very clear because there was some part with dealing really with the technologies or electrical technologies and some other part related to telecommunication. Now, the, what's happened with IoT is that this border has become much more fluid. So everything become connected. So it's quite normal that these groups start to part overlap and part collaborate. What I mean is essentially that it's normal that uh, uh, Sense Analytics start to talk more about how data are transmitted. But it's also quite normal that Etsy, which has an experience in telecommunication and as a, in, uh, in general in ICT communication, which have the know-how about how to build architecture protocols and communication, start to work more closely with the more, uh, let me say, with the technology, which just some years ago were only in the domain of sense analog maybe. So that's a little bit to express uh, uh, the, this thing. The other thing which I think is very important to remember that for Etsy, all the standards are public. So which makes much, much more easy access to the information. Uh, doesn't mean that the use of the standard is still subject to the IPR of the company which have put the standards inside, but what is happening that you can read, you can judge, you can get all the information, you can understand what it, what it is uh, without any, any uh, paying anything. And another thing is that even in the case that the use is very wide, the, even the charge of IPR is regulated under what are called front rules fair and reasonable for everybody. So that's very important. If, if a standard does not respect these things, it's excluded by it. So that makes a very open environment. And another thing which is important to remember on that thing is that, uh, that is again relevant for the smart lift area, is that the footprint of it in terms of participating company is global, even is a European standard organization is global. So that has made the possibility, especially in the case of Smart Lift, to attract the attention of a, a big number of SMEs working in, in, a, in the area, but also the attention of a big player in the, in the domain of Smart Lift, essentially because what we build, even we build in Etsy, is recognized globally. And another thing which is very important is that uh, uh, is as, as a characteristic as a standard organization is built by different players. So there are a lot of SMEs, there are a lot of government entities, but there are really a big part is made by uh, com uh, companies, including research, including user association. So that means the standardization, mm, mm, more free respect to other schemes which are used to go in a more hierarchical way to the national uh, the national committees and then to a joint committees. Here you can have a, a lot of direct access from the company and the stakeholder. Saying that, the other part which is still relevant for uh, uh, Smart Lift is that uh, there are a lot of partnership, but there are two partnerships which are really built as a partnership with other standard bodies which are relevant in this game. The first one has been already mentioned by Orindinam, which is 1 and 2M by Sure, which provides a big tool to build on. But there is also 3GPP, which is very important, of course, everyone knows it in the standard environment for mobile, which provides the communication for voice. So that means essentially that when you build a system, you don't have to work on everything. You can really work on something and build on top of what we have without doing things. Um, typically in this environment, it's not good because you are really doing things fast, quickly, with less resources than people that have spent a four year developing a full system, which is robust, manageable, secure. Now, going to the smart lift, uh, essentially, we develop uh, some specifications, but which are uh, 
we will detail more in the next two presentations, uh, which is the S1 of 3735 and season and the technical report which has anticipated that. And uh, the SARF for lift, which is both driving us in the area of ontology, will be presented as last presentation by Mauro. What is for me is very important to underline is that has been developed with the support of a two major lift association was started really by FESME, which is the association of uh, uh, SMEs in working in the area, the European Association of SME working in the area of smart lift, which covers the majority of the European market by the way. And uh, uh, where also Marco, which is speak after me, is a, has been as a representative for long time, and ILA, which is uh, the association which involves some SME, but also, let me say, the big company working in the area of Smart Leaf, which have a, a worldwide presence. And that was a very important component. Another important component that we'll talk a little bit more, Marco, is that in parallel, we try to develop a POC, a proof of concept to get feedback. And what is very important, we were we really did all the specification from the system to the signals, even in a first version, which is in any case quite usable, in nine months, which is a very short period for a specification like that, starting almost by zero. But the, what was the key? We didn't start by zero. We really focalized all our attention on the smart leaf part, because we have one and one on the bottom, which solve management, security, communication. So reusing one and one, which is a general platform and is a general platform designed for both support and also for interworking with other platforms and other solution. Essentially, we have really to concentrate on the smart lift part and forget the rest. The rest is provided by one and two one. And that was really the added value to be able to do a specification like that in so short time. And that's uh, really, I was very happy of that. Then I just mentioned that, but I will call again, get talk again, that there is a, 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 a twin specification on escalator, which are started. And we have also an idea of migrating this specification to a European norm sooner or later. Now, just a summary, when I will close this introduction, what are the ingredients of doing that? Sector stakeholder interest and support, because we, Without the interest, we didn't start. Without the support, we don't know what is a smart lift. So remember the long uh, talks with Marco, which explained me all the elements of a smart lift and how it works and some of her colleagues, because I'm a telco guy, I'm not a smart lift guy. So I need to, I have a learning curve of that. Then this is more my competence, having tools. And I call it one and two M a tool in this game because it was a tool in this game. The tool that we use to speed up, we have, we have SARF, which helps us to assure more work on semantic operativity that Mauro will introduce later. Mm -hmm. And this is another tool. And the third tool was the 3GP part on voice call, which is already included in the lift, but we have to work also to evolve to 5G voice over IP calls. And the rest is simply know how of the people, the organization, have been processes, but uh, let me say the technical contents is all in the second line and the first line. That's the technical content. The rest is, let me say, uh, the normal business of the standardization people <laughs> that have this kind of experience. Now I will uh, close this talk. So uh, thank you for listening for this introduction, and I'm very happy. That uh, to I don't know if I were, I were in them if you want to do say something or we go directly to Mark. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. I thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this important meeting. My name is Marco Cogliati. I'm uh, Italian. I have uh, been working in the elevator sector for 25 years, uh, and in particular, uh, I project the elevation system. 
Uh, I am an FASM, European Federation for uh, Elevator Small and Medium Sizes Enterprises, uh, and uh, SBS, uh, Small Business Standards Expert. Uh, and uh, as such, I participate uh, in the Smart M2M Technical Committee of ETSI. Uh, I have been working uh, for years uh, for uh, the TRIA Consortium. The TRIA Consortium is a company that groups uh, 20 small and medium enterprises uh, in Italy. And uh, we manage uh, in total about uh, 35,000 elevators. In recent years, uh, I have dedicated myself uh, to the study and research for IoT system for the elevator sector. The consortium strongly believes uh, that uh, digitalization uh, in our sector can be of great help uh, to all members uh, of uh, the consortium. That's why we have been working for a few years uh, to find uh, an IoT solution that uh, can be applied uh, to our uh, reality. One of the difficulties uh, in the development of this project uh, is that Elevator has a very extent, extensive uh, uh, series of variants. Uh, for example, manufactured model type uh, compliance with different regulation or uh, different technologies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So not uh, a single product, uh, but uh, a series uh, of uh, different objects uh, to apply a system uh, that can guarantee a connection uh, and exchange of data. The first uh, POC, proofs of concept, uh, development uh, in 2019 uh, and based uh, on the very the high level hardware and software providers, uh, did not give the, the desired result. That is, uh, the main problem was not technical, but economic. It was not economically sustainable for our markets. In October in 2019, as an FSM SBS expert, I had the opportunity to participate in the drafting of the Etsy Smart Lifts technical report. My contribution was uh, contained. Uh, I helped uh, the participant uh, of the working table to close uh, uh, the part uh, related uh, to use uh, cases. Uh, with uh, this document, uh, however, uh, we have started a more in deep study, which uh, will uh, materialize in a few months, uh, uh, in a few months' time, uh, into a technical specification but which uh, immediately gave uh, me the opportunity to work in parallel with uh, a second pilot project using uh, the parameters uh, that we uh, codified uh, in the Etsy document. This made uh, it possible to create an IoT project for smart lifts uh, based uh, on the one m 2 m platform, which incorporates uh, all the data defined uh, in the technical specification. Proceeding in the study uh, and drafting uh, of the document, uh, we have seen that the road uh, we are going down is in line with uh, what we had set out to do, namely the creation of the IoT system for elevators that can be approached in different ways, with different device and with any type of elevators equipped with the communication system. Lifts prior to the IoT are technologically advanced system, and this obviously depends on the years of installation. They communicate uh, in many cases uh, directly with the lift company by sending messages either via SMS or mails. That company once received the message forwards, forwards it uh, to the technician who goes uh, to the plant uh, to try to solve uh, the problem. This is, of course, a summary of uh, this process. New elevators uh, called the smart lifts uh, are a machine that have uh, in or around them a device that can communicate. They generally have a control panel equipped uh, with the communication systems 
and uh, they can uh, have a number of thirty part system. For example, uh, heat sensors, uh, vibration sensors, uh, water or seismic sensor, and uh, they collect and exchange data. The IoT elevator system, uh, it provides that the elevator uh, can communicate uh, or directly with uh, the technician sending in real time data or the state of uh, operation and failure, can receive uh, and exchange information uh, with uh, uh, the user himself, uh, then uh, receive uh, calls for smartphone, etc. These types of approach uh, have developed a lot uh, with uh, the advent of COVID-19. Through a gateway, it also collects information for, from a 30 part system and on the sensory side that is then sent to the company and the IoT platform. The IoT platform stores, processes and returns data from the collected elevators. In addition, uh, the most important things uh, that uh, it can connect uh, if desired uh, and exchange data with the adjacent systems, then create interoperability between uh, multiple parts, uh, between multiple sectors uh, and if desired around the world. The pilot project uh, development uh, to date returns data to the dashboard uh, configured uh, in according uh, to the necessary need. I can have uh, visibility of uh, all plants uh, with uh, the relative uh, efficiency. I can see the location by region. I can get into the merits uh, of the individual plants, uh, seeing uh, the basic uh, characteristics, uh, how many times it stopped uh, in a day, in a week, uh, in a month, in a year, or the reason uh, why it uh, stopped. I can check how many races uh, it has done, in which direction, what is the most frequent floor. I can check if maintenance visit has been made and will they have been carried out. If I want, I create custom dashboards, for example, in a hospital, or I can send the main data of my elevator to allow to verify only the operation in Industrial 5, for example. As you can imagine, the interoperability of IoT system opened the doors to generation of new services. And that is definitely a first advantage, maybe the biggest. If we talk about the real intangible advantages that companies that adopt this system, uh, can have uh, they are, for example, an optimization of the intervention times of technician, uh, but above uh, all, uh, an elevator of the efficiency of the interve uh, intervention itself. If we tie IoT development to artificial intelligence, uh, then we talk about preventive and predictive maintenance and. Uh, here, a world opens and uh, open up uh, uh, related to efficiency, starting from the warehouse uh, personnel, uh, the growth of the plants uh, signed to a single uh, to a single maintenance, uh, etc. I personally believe that the IoT system uh, will become an integral part of our lives. Uh, many already are. If we uh, look uh, at the projection of growth and expansion of the IoT connected objects, we immediately understand that we depend in the, to the future. This is a technological evolution, and I believe we, can, uh, we cannot do without it. This is my experience. Thank you for your attention. I leave the floor to Mauro. No, it's me, it's me again. Sorry. Ah, okay. Okay. Me. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, how are you done? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Marco. Uh, it was uh, wonderful and quite insightful. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, you represent EFE SME. Uh, so 
uh, I believe the questions are at the end of the session, right, Arun? Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, I was unmuting myself. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so then we should move on to our next speaker, Dr. Mauro Dragoni. No, it's me again. So, uh, yeah. Okay, it's back to you. Yeah. Okay. Enrico, yeah. Okay, Enrico. Yeah. So off to you. Again. I am. <laughs> yes, and uh, as said, the uh, invite. They were all the questions to be set on the chat, and we will try to answer at the end. Okay, um, I think I'm, I'm ready. Now I I try to enter a little bit more in a uh, from the work which has been done in the relation with one and two M and SAR, but also to try to describe a little bit what is this specification. First of all, here you see a time plane. So you see all the time from the original technical report to the beginning of the smart lift specification in March 21 and the publication that uh, we did it uh, uh, essentially in, uh, uh, in sorry, the specific the publication where we did it in March 21. And then the work that we are doing on the proof of concept, the demos, but also what we are thinking for the future to work on a future release. And in parallel also the SARS specification, which has been released uh, again, I was in, in the beginning of 2021. And uh, let's, this is a little bit a timeline, but uh, I want to drive you a little bit uh, in the history of this document. First thing that we have verified is the fact that the requirements coming from the smart leaf were really sophisticated in terms of IoT, in the sense that uh, they have, let me say, requirements in terms of uh, remote maintenance, remote monitoring, and, and this kind of requirements, but also the requirement to interact with uh, control rooms that manage multiple lifts, the need uh, of uh, uh, interacting with the buildings and more in general with the smart cities, the need to interacting with the users. And that means that whatever we have designed needs to be quite future proof and quite able to evolve to something which can be very sophisticated and have a lot of uh, in relevance to collect the data for uh, big data learning and artificial intelligence management in order to arrive to build something really sophisticated. And uh, uh, was in, we made this check because sometimes uh, in IoT, we tend uh, to overshoot uh, the customers with uh, uh, sophisticated solution when it is not needed. But here, the, the environment, the aim was really to reach something which can be very sophisticated in, in, in the future. Second thing is try to describe a little bit the elements. The first thing that we have tried to do is to try to identify what we have in the architecture, because if we have to define an IoT system, which is interworkable, even before thinking what protocol, what messages, you have to understand which are the elements of the talk. And here uh, we get some uh, very useful information from the, from the lift experts because there was something, let me say, obvious, the smart lift object. But the fact that the smart lift object can be a set of smart lift or can be even a combination of multiple elements in case of additional sensor on an existing installation, the relevance of a, a non standard solution and legacy solution, that's the message that we receive. But we also receive a very useful information which is the interaction with the administrative managed platform, which manage the things and manage the alarms, which, uh, uh, which means that we have to put this element in the architecture. Here you see five numbers, which you can map in the architecture here. On the left, you have really the smart lift with additional sanctions, which is number five. But you have the administrative platform, which is number two. We have the cloud service, which is number three. Then you have the interworking with the legacy, which is built on number four, but also a piece of number five, sorry. 
And what is very important also to underline that here you have a distribution of intelligence. The edge control unit is intelligent by itself, is a, is in a, a quite sophisticating, actuating, acting element. On the other side, you have in the cloud all the historization of data, which can be used for um, maintenance for a lot of other interaction. But you have this classical split with a split that happens very often in IoT is really present here with a serious elaboration capacity in the edge and a, a very big storage and uh, analysis capacity in the cloud. That's a little bit the key of uh, all this architecture. And that's what I think. Another thing is all the information which are included that you see here, we have to take care of all the identification and all the information just to give an idea. We have to identify the sleep, but we have also to get uh, uh, a lot of information about uh, the kind of lift, uh, the, really what are the, the location of the lift. So we have this identification, we have this administrative information, who is the owner, who is the building manager, who are the users, the configuration of the lift, how it is configured, how many doors, where hey, they have to open. Some dynamic things about the status is the leaf operative or not? There are the fire brigade operation or not? That's are really important information. We, there is the technician which is checking the, the lift. The statistic information, so all the information how much is used, how many calls for floor, how many run. The fault information, because when something happens, we need faults and alarm. The possibility to issue commands from remote. I can really, one typical case was perform test operation. All the, in it, at least in, a, in Europe, all the lifts which are open to the public have to make a test run in the, in every day. So we can really make this test run from remote, but you can also give a customer the possibility to call the, the lift at a certain floor from the, its own smartphone. Power energy information, Something is very obvious with the battery, but there are a lot of also the consumption, the status of the batteries, or let's say in general, all the information that is there. And also very important, the communication system, which uh, is the phone that you have in the, in the lift to call in case of problem, which have all needs to be tested, needs to be verified, needs to be worked, needs to go to certain. And this is the part which is also very important in the communication. In the future, even more, because now is a voice communication in the regulation that will become a multimedia communication very short. Now, 1 and 2M was the key to avoid to concentrate on anything else which is not. Practically, we work on these two pages because the rest was provided by 1 and 2M. Of course, we have to make the mapping of what we have in architecture of 1 and 2M. Basically, we don't have to take care of the security, the encryption, the management, the storage, the historization of data, the, how you plug in additional functionality. Everything was here. And that's all of us to make this work in nine months because this work was already done. The one and one work was already done. Why to use one and two M? Simply because he had everything whichever was ever needed. We didn't find a functionality we, we, we were missing in one and two M for this use case, but in general for a lot of use cases. And even more important, it provides all the information to interact with the, all the architecture and the solution because one and two M is a big interworking framework to interact with the legacies and with the non-standard platform and non-standard lift. And uh, I don't know, if, let me go back for one second. For this picture, it's not so obvious, but you have new lift which put it data on the cloud, old lift and old platform will get data on the cloud. But you can also extract from non standard platforms data related to other lift and new lift. So 
So you are really the possibility to put the ecosystem and put them together. That's the power of one and one. Do not is not another standard. Is a standard which puts the other solution communication. Of course, it can be native, but all is designed to have the exchange of information from the new things and the old things, and even enabling the communication between old things using one and one. So you really get that a non-standard platform can get the information about the other lift and the new lift, and this is extremely powerful in in terms of. Uh, potentially join, put together the ecosystem which exists, rather than to try to uh, colonize one ecosystem with one solution. Okay, I would uh, just uh, go to introduce a little bit Mauro part. In one and two M, there is, there is not, uh, they say, is not uh, uh, hard-coded any semantic ontology. One and two M is performing interworking and exchange of information, but supports the use of ontologies. So one and two M has a very, let me say, basic ontology, which is built on uh, recognizing who is the user, what are the elements, but doesn't know anything about the sensor, but is carrying the information that this object is a sensor. In, in, so I can carry a semantic, description of what are the objects. So that's a little bit what we did it in one and one. So it's a general platform for every service simply because the characteristic of the service are not uh, coded in the platform, but the platform support the ability of carrying the information about what are the services and what are the semantic on top. And that's another thing which is very important. It's not only one and one, all the modern protocol tend to decouple the, the uh, service layer and the semantic of the service respect to the information of the storage managing uh, security part, which is the couplet. But one and two is carrying this information in this semantic descriptor. This allows essentially the fact that one and two is a big uh, interworking framework where you have something which is not one and two M, which is on the left of the picture, which is able to store information on one and two M via what is called an interworking proxy end. But one and two M specify the architecture, it specify the way in which the interworking should be done, but does not specify the interworking because the interworking is characteristic of every sector. So what we did it is to define some rules to map your vertical domain ontology, if you want your data model or informational model, on the one and two M elements we carry that and mark that you are using that specific ontology in a, that specific way. That's essentially allowed to perform an interoperability level between the objects. Mm. Typical example, if you have a light in a in house, they are with it, we call it light, we call it a, a, a switch to have on off, you have one zero. You have a lot of different ways of representing the same information, but the information is still the same. There are no reasons why you should not be able to understand that information just because it's called differently or just because it's organized slightly differently. The concept is the same, and that's exactly what is designing the semantic world. It's so true, and this is an example that we ran some years ago, uh, uh, that we connect a car with a tractor. The use case was simply um, a, a tractor which is entering in the road and is, advised, is alerting the car that a slow machine is on the road. And to let them talk, for me, was a little, a little bit funny because they both have CAN bus. They have the same bus, the same low level protocol, but they need something which helps the mapping in the middle. And that thing was at one and two M. So we were able by one and two M to let talk one car which had the CAN bus, but use his own semantic to talk with an agricultural machine which has the CAN bus, but is talking another semantic 
and one and two M gets the matching things. And that was quite a nice example of use of one and two M, even in, in something which at first glance looks not necessary. I will not enter in the detail of the base ontology because there, first of all, there are no time and there are some examples made by Mauro, but that's the base ontology one and two M, which is essentially a structure of objects, of let me say typology of objects, which have characteristics, which can be functionality, can be classes, subclasses, etc., which becomes mapped when you have a certain device, which has a certain service, which is the temperature, which has a certain operation, which is literally the temperature. This is essentially the world of semantic. Now, uh, how we use it semantic? In this is Martin Twain, we are working on SARF. And SARF, what essentially is a is a smart up, start a smart appliance and become a smart application, which essentially is doing this thing, is try to get ontologies in a certain sector, mm, car, manufacturing, energy, buildings, try to consolidate the ontology which are used in a certain sector and put it in this methodology, which is called SARF, we try to look at the commonalities between these ontologies. And this essentially result in something which is specific for the product, something which is in common with the sector of the product, and something which is in common with all the sector. Make an example. Uh, program five or a dishwasher is known only over product of a producer of the dishwasher. But the fact that a dishwasher has a certain time and consumption is something common to all the dishwashers, so all the good things of that sector. The fact that it's consuming a certain energy as a sentence, which is in common for practically all, all the sector in this environment. So you have a few levels, there is something which is from the domain, something which is in the core SARF, which is a specific specification. Now, the good thing is that the core RF ontology is practically equivalent to the one and two M base ontology we designed the parts like that. That provides a solution where you have some vertical model which is described by means of SARF and is mapped to SARF as an extension card in FC in future we offer will be done directly one and two M. One and two M, which provides the base ontology and the rules of mapping all the data notation. So you can get the vertical ontology defined according to the SARF things, getting it on top of one and two M, and then one and two M is taking care of all the communication part, all the management. That's a little bit the scheme. And then just to finish, introduce the work of, uh, of uh, Mauro. Here you see uh, where we are with SARF in this is Martin 2M, where we have made the SARF core or now five years ago, which in the energy building and environment vertical sector. We worked on smart city, industry, manufacturing, smart agriculture, then automotive health, which is well wearable and smart water. And we are the smart lift as well in the last year. Not all the things are at the same level of development. Some are very good, like uh, the energy building, especially the energy. When we start for smart appliance with the support of a major association of smart appliances, at least in Europe. We work on the general building model. So some of them are solid. Some of them, uh, we just scratch the surface. Like uh, smart city is uh, uh, incredible waste of sharing of things. <laughs> So it's clear that we started, but it's, it's not absolutely completed in any way. It, uh, some other are very detailed. This example of Smart Leaf, we were able to make this consolidation based on the specification we mentioned before. So it's very precise and concrete. And uh, uh, I mentioned that there is the portal, but it can be described by Ragoni and Mauro that uh, will uh, that allow everyone to contribute to, to, to SARF, even also from a member of FC. And then the rest, I only close with one thing. Remember that uh, it's something that's to repeat very often. 
IoT is not selecting a protocol, selecting a platform, selecting a, an architecture. That's that's a detail. It comes after. IoT starts when you are really sharing the information and the meaning of information between different systems, different applications, and different business sector. Then the rest is a consequence. It's very important, the rest, because I want to do with things more easy and more efficiently. But at the very end, if you don't get that result, uh, you are just uh, connecting remote system, but you are not really doing the IoT. You need to really to share the information. Thank you, and I will give it back to the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Enrico. <clears throat> Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, maybe you <clears throat> laid the foundation for uh, the ontologies uh, uh, for uh, Dr. Mauro Dragoni to actually take it forward. I think he's going to talk uh, more about the Sarif ontologies. So over to you, Dr. Mauro, uh, with your presentation. Thank you. I hope that you can hear me well and that you are able to see my screen okay yes um okay good uh, afternoon or good morning to everyone depending on where you are in the world uh, i'm maud and i'm a research scientist uh, at uh, fundation von kessler i'm a member of the process and intelligence unit uh, that is part of the digital health research uh, center as has been already introduced at the beginning of this uh, webinar one of my main uh, competency is related to knowledge management and basically this is the uh, the role that I cover I mean within the team uh, the big team of uh, Etsy uh, with which I started to collaborate in 2019 uh, on about building SARF extensions um, so in this uh, talk I will uh, continue the presentation of SARF just to give you further details uh, uh, behind Saref, and then uh, I will present you one of the extensions, actually the last one that we developed, that is the Saref for Lift one, in order to show you what, what uh, it is possible to do by using uh, ontology-based representations uh, in a uh, single domain, and then to uh, try to give you also some insight of what uh, it would be possible to do already also in the future. So first of all, what is SARF and why SARF is important for supporting the interoperability in the industry sector, not only the industry sector, but to support interoperability uh, in a more whole uh, uh, broad concept. Okay, Because as already mentioned by Enrico, interoperability is something that is definitely important uh, for supporting the connection of different devices, different IoT platforms, uh, etc. And the best use, uh, the best way for supporting the interoperability is to adopt a conceptual model. SARF has been thought exactly for this purpose, so for developing a conceptual model for supporting the interoperability in the industry sector. And uh, SARF started, uh, I mean, is is a journey in two thousand. And, uh, and 15, and, it, and also it started um, from the vision of uh, a group of people uh, that uh, started to develop, to adopt a step-by-step -step approach, uh, and also to develop a small project, and working project by project, believing in the vision, the clear vision that they have about concerning the adoption of inter of. Uh, uh, conceptual models for supporting in the interoperability. Um, so SARF, uh, there are several way, ways for describing what SARF is. The most uh, uh, well-known one is the conceptual model itself uh, that uh, started from uh, um, an explicit uh, request from an industry because the interaction with the industry sectors, uh, in the industry, different industry domains, um, happened already from the beginning, and uh, all the components of SARF uh, has been built uh, uh, in a bottom-up, uh, by using a bottom-up methodology, starting from existing data models, ex existing protocols, and those existing standards, in order to not <coughs> lose uh, the, uh, the focus on which was the final, uh, the final um, uh, objective. 
of, of SARF and why SARF and where SARF has to be adopted. It's one of the common mistakes when, uh, as knowledge engineer, we started to develop conceptual models is uh, to start thinking at a very abstract level and not from the domain in which the conceptual model has to be deployed. So uh, the development of SARF uh, uh, and also on of its uh, extensions uh, uh, didn't do this mistake because we always started from the actual need of the different uh, of the of the different environments and the, and then given the need and uh, the requirement of working in the bottom up way with the main expert we adopted uh, always an iterative and interactive approach uh, with the main expert in order to reflect within the ontologies the thing that the requirements that uh, were provided uh, from the, the community and then uh, this uh, <clears throat> this methodology already allowed us to uh, uh, create uh, step by step uh, I mean, to increase step by step the trust that the single domain single communities had within the work that we were doing so that it was a definitely a winning uh, pathway for the success of SARF. But SARF is not only the conceptual model itself, because there are also a set of technical specifications that uh, are uh, included within, uh, within SARF, containing also the evolution of the SARF conceptual model and, cons and containing also the detailed descriptions of uh, each extension. Uh, then uh, SARF is also uh, a portal with a lot of documentation about the conceptual model that we developed, uh, is in the way, uh, is in the understanding of all the work that has been provided, has been done behind the scene of, uh, of the SARF, and also to understand which is the meaning of each concept that has been modeled within the conceptual model. Indeed, uh, without having this clear documentation, this uh, user-friendly way for uh, navigating through it, it, it would be very hard to understand uh, the meaning of each concept, but uh, through the system that uh, we set up, it is uh, it is very easy to understand uh, and also to disambiguate uh, which are which is which are the meanings of each concept and how they can be instantiated for supporting the representation of, uh, for example, IoT devices or, or for supporting the uh, communications, the, the modeling of the communication between uh, between different devices. Uh, then it is what is open is not only the documentation but also the repository for the developers within the Etsy community because all the ontologies put together with the requirements, the examples that have been uh, developed, and also the documentation and the diagrams of both SAF core and also for all extensions are publicly available uh, in order to also foster the, uh, uh, the continuous feedback process and also to foster possible evolution of both the self core uh, ontology but uh, also for supporting possible refinements of uh, of the extensions and then as been already uh, has been already listed by by Enrico early uh, self is not only the core ontology but we have a list of uh, of uh, of extensions targeting specific uh, specific domains, including the smart list one. Then I will I would like to spend just a couple of words uh, before switching to the uh, self for lift uh, description about which are the also the the impacts that actually are expected by using the ontology because uh, um, they are. Um, uh, the awareness about the fact that ontologies are used uh, uh, often in many fields. There are scientific community work on it. Uh, a lot of project uh, uh, built uh, upon on the design of conceptual model, but uh, sometimes it's quite uh, hard uh, to understand why the ontology can have uh, uh, positive impacts on uh, on the industry industry sectors in general. Basically, the idea of using ontology is. Uh, towards the uh, definition of uh, uh, standard recommendations supporting the design of uh, IoT-based or uh, AI-based supporting platforms for the domain experts. 
Let me use the example of the predictive maintenance, for example, by using a common representations of the data alerts and information coming from uh, the um, uh, smart list, for example, it would be easy to uh, um, provide uh, AI-based uh, decision support solutions for avoiding uh, possible uh, errors or possible malfunctions of of machines and uh, this uh, uh, recommend uh, this uh, uh, standardization uh, aspects uh, can have both uh, impact on the working environment itself but also on the market since uh, by using uh, ontology by using uh, common conceptual models for representing information and for representing data. It would be possible to, it would be easy to develop new services to increase uh, the trustworthiness of uh, industries and also of citizens uh, towards the adoption of uh, novelty, uh, novelty uh, solutions. Then, uh, by going too much the detail to uh, go in the more technical aspects of one of the extensions of, of SARC, that is the Cypher for Rift one. Um, I prepared, uh, I mean, a description of which was the process that we follow for uh, developing this, uh, uh, this, ex this extension, and also to provide you some details about how this extension can be used and which are the uh, potentialities for. Um, for adopting this way of representing knowledge and data that can be useful for the entire smart lift se sector. Uh, so as already mentioned, Cypher for Lift uh, is an extension of the Cypher core ontology dedicated to this domain. And um, it is basically composed by two parts. The first one is the formal description uh, of uh, the knowledge related to the smart lift uh, domain. Uh, and then uh, what we included in the extensions in the extension is also um, a set of uh, real world examples showing how this extension can be instantiated okay um, into a real world environment concerning the uh, uh, the bidding process uh, this process followed uh, uh, several steps and the first one was to start from the specific that both the specific document that both Enrico and Marco mentioned early uh, that uh, uh, provided uh, the preliminary information allowed us as knowledge engineers to better understand the domain that we were going to model. Then we didn't limit it to, uh, uh, to the analysis of these documents, but uh, the, uh, the, the second step uh, was related to the uh, gathering of uh, and, and the analysis of existing standards about uh, the uh, smart leaf domain in order to um, also have uh, a further source of knowledge for understanding if there, are, there were further concepts that needed to be modeled or uh, specific features or uh, data, uh, data properties that uh, have to, that were important to be uh, to be mentioned. After this uh, this work, uh, we started to design all uh, uh, to acquire all the requirements. Um, the definition of the requirements uh, uh, passed through the uh, definition of the competency questions. Uh, that uh, is a common way. Uh, when we design ontologies for understanding which uh, which are the the kind of uh, um, uh, questions and answers that the ontology has to be able to provide to the users that uh, will uh, will have to use it. Okay, so uh, this uh, task is performed uh, iterative. It was performed iterative iteratively. Um, among the uh, the entire knowledge expert teams, in order to detect uh, which were the all the information that were needed to be modeled uh, and also to extract and to, to identify which are which is which was the set of complete entities that needed to be perf to be included in this extension then we start uh, we, we, we performed the first draft uh, of the conceptual model 
So here, what uh, uh, has been done is the definition of here. I, I provided some some screenshot of the um, of the of the core part of the more abstract part of the cipher lift extension in which we provided the more the uh, um, main elements main concepts that have been defined together also with the connections of uh, existing concepts that were defined uh, together within the Saref core extension the Saref core ontology that is the, the, the light one, and uh, also other extensions like the Saref for systems and Saref for building. Um, now, I mean, it's not uh, the, the, the venue here for, I mean, obviously describing all the concept, but uh, in uh, our port, in our website, uh, everything uh, is, uh, is available uh, to get all the, the, the diagrams uh, as well. Then after the definition of the conceptual model, we went through a, uh, a validation and refinement process for checking if uh, everything uh, were, was, uh, was compliant with, uh, with the uh, standards that we analyzed with the specifics that were provided you know, to show that everything was aligned. And then we proceed to the definition of examples in order to foster in the, uh, to improve the understandability of our ontology. The examples ranging from uh, graphical instantiation with respect to some, uh, some use cases, ranging from very simple instantiation, for example, the definition of uh, a smart lift installation, for example, to more complex scenarios like uh, the uh, representation of uh, the collection of uh, st statistical uh, uh, information that can be collected from the uh, uh, from the sensors from the from all the devices, uh, or to represent, for example, a complete uh, a complete uh, screenshot of uh, uh, a deployment of a smart lift installation within uh, a specific a specific building. In all the examples uh, we provided, we described uh, which properties have been used and also how values can be instantiated. This is a graphical presentation for understand, for just, uh, uh, let me say, as a first uh, uh, picture of uh, how ontologies can be instantiated for representing the uh, uh, specific uh, specific scenarios but uh, what we provide uh, is also uh, the technical definition the technical representation of uh, each uh, example in which we instantiate from the semant at the semantic level the uh, um, we represent at the semantic level each uh, each example uh, this format uh, is uh, uh, I mean represent uh, the interoperability core of using ontologies since this data can be easily processed uh, by uh, tools allowing to convert them to different uh, to different formats when needed and at the same time to represent by using a common uh, knowledge also information that uh, can be provided by several uh, IoT uh, platforms or several IoT devices that uh, by design adopt uh, different formats. So the, this, uh, uh, the, the, the purpose is this one, but at the same time, the purpose of these uh, kind of structures is also to drive in some way the design and the, and the construction of uh, the next generation of uh, IoT devices or, for example, a very uh, I mean, optimistic way, the design of the next generation of smart list in order that they were able to, to integrate by design a database representation uh, based on this, on this conceptual model. And finally, uh, obviously, all the work that has been done uh, led to the, uh, the publication of the ontology itself, of, of all the documentation uh, and all the technical specifications concerning the SARF extension. Uh, obviously, the work that we did uh, was uh, 
a, a first version of, uh, of this extension since uh, uh, thanks to the interaction uh, also with, with people like Marco and also with the standardization, standardization body, uh, further refinements can be uh, provided within this, uh, uh, this ontology and uh, also it is something that uh, we think uh, uh, to do during the next, uh, the next few months. Obviously, for, inc for uh, uh, increasing the, uh, uh, the awareness uh, of, uh, of what we did and also for increasing the, uh, the uh, uh, exploitation of, of this extension, it is important, for, it will be important for us to develop new liaison, new liaison with the standard bodies and also to uh, deploy this ontology into uh, real world scenarios where possible in order to start to validate the ontology into real world uh, environments. So thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Morrow. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving the details about the Sarah ontology. Uh, now, are there any questions uh, posed by the participants here? Uh, we don't see any raised hands. And uh, in that case, then I can uh, perhaps uh, ask certain questions on behalf of the participants to, I mean, simplify the, the, the complex subject that is. With your permission, uh, uh, Dr. Aaron. Yes, please. Yes, please. <clears throat> So, uh, fine. So, uh, my first question is uh, uh, primarily to Marco because uh, uh, he represents the AFE SME as well. Uh, with regards to uh, the standardization, because we have been talking about standardization of uh, smart lifts. Uh, now, the basic question that perhaps is there in the back of the minds of uh, all the participants here is that uh, everybody sees lifts uh, being a very, uh, I mean, integral part of a building. Uh, nevertheless, uh, digitalization of those lifts are an absolute necessity. But what are the use cases, specific use cases that uh, actually mandates the IOTification or uh, for uh, to talk about it simply is to have a connected lift ecosystem. So why do we want which use cases prompts us to actually connect all the lifts and make an ecosystem where we are talking about uh, an IoT ecosystem of the lifts, smart lifts. Uh, maybe uh, Marco can take this question and anybody else, if uh, uh, any one of you, Enrico or Dr. Morrow want to talk about it, uh, you're most welcome. So over to you, uh, Marco. Allora, I, uh, I think uh, we started with uh, uh, our markets. Our markets is uh, uh, probably is uh, uh, more different from uh, uh, from Indian markets, for example. Uh, we live in Italy, and uh, we have uh, uh, some time uh, types uh, of uh, uh, of elevators. Uh, in, in generally, uh, we work uh, with uh, a, um, a, a little elevator uh, if uh, we look at the loads of the elevator and uh, the stops of the elevators. But uh, uh, when uh, we, we try to, uh, to enter in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this world uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for try to develop uh, this, uh, this user case, uh, we, uh, we take in account uh, uh, some different uh, example of, for, of, for lift. Uh, in, in, in general, we, we, we try to, uh, to understand better uh, uh, the systems because uh, in the in the our markets uh, there are uh, very various types of lifts and uh, uh, we we try to check uh, uh, a, um, 
in, in one way, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, the new lift uh, installer uh, in, uh, in this year, uh, uh, they, they, they had uh, uh, in, um, on board uh, the system of communication, but uh, there are uh, very a lot of uh, uh, lifts without uh, communication system on board. And uh, we try to uh, image uh, how uh, this lift uh, uh, this lift uh, uh, work uh, in IoT system, and uh, uh, in uh, in the one hand uh, with uh, the user case, uh, and uh, the the in the other hand uh, with the uh, proof of concept, uh, we check it uh, this uh, this aspect for uh, uh, stand to try to standardization. Uh, the, the protocol of communication uh, with the, the old lift and the new lift. Um, may I add something, if you allow me? Uh, Marco has underlined the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of different type of lift installed in Italy, for partially for, uh, for the characteristic of installation, small houses, and part for the characteristic of the fact that they have been deployed. A long, uh, long, very long period of time. So there are really a lot of legacy elements, and that's one thing. Uh, but uh, when I look at uh, at uh, the major request that we received uh, as a first request uh, was to help uh, the maintenance people of the elevator to to interact with the elevator to know in advance what's happened, to get some information, I mean, in long run, uh, in, a, in a short run, really, medium term, uh, to uh, some remote maintenance activities. Uh, in any case, everything can facilitate the, eleva the elevator maintenance company to manage the elevator. And that was really, uh, I think, the first uh, use case. But on side of that, we discover shortly that there are uh, other type of, of uh, use cases. One I mentioned even during the presentation is the one of the fact that all the, all the installation in a, in, a, in a, open to the public have to make a trial run in every morning. And just to give an idea, uh, in, in a few years ago, but still in a lot of cases, there is really one guy which personally goes there and push the button and make the run physically. If you multiply that for all the station, all the public buildings, you understand that is quite a, a huge amount and you never be sure that everything has been done correctly because you don't have a, a full trace of that. Uh, for that was another use case, having the ability to perform this run from remote, having the ability to have some kind of alarm as a kind of situation from remote was really another use case that was very, very important. And the third type of use cases is exactly related to the final users things. Currently in, a, in private installation, we pay by floor essentially. In, so the people which are highest floor pay more for the, their share in the building for the elevator. But you can arrive at, to a pay per use of the floor and help the uh, building administrator to, 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 to have uh, uh, a more precise um, repartition of the cost of the maintenance and uh, of elevator. That's are some example, but you can have also compared people which have two access to elevator and they found the elevator at the floor rather than uh, calling them. Uh, you have situation in which uh, if you are not in a safe environment, it's better that you wait less possible. So again, calling the elevator in advance is important. So these are the kind of use cases which have tried. Um, I'm just mentioning the fact that all, all these use cases are uh, really listed in the technical report, which has been uh, uh, mentioned by, by Marco during his presentation. So you remember that we have a, a TR, HCTR uh, uh, 103.546, which is the technical report, which is that they contain these use cases that then we have 
try to implement in, uh, in the technical standard 103725. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Enrico. Uh, <clears throat> the second question that uh, came to my mind is that that all the standardization uh, seems to be happening in the European part of the continents. Uh, what are the other continents doing about smart lifts? I'm sure uh, US and uh, I mean uh, the Asia Pacific is not way behind because uh, high rise buildings are uh, there as well. So any, any uh, idea about uh, the standardization efforts going on in these uh, continents? But uh, let me say one thing I try to answer. Um, when, when we, while we are doing this work, we look around and uh, uh, we saw something at global level in ITUT as something in uh, ISO, but are very, very raw. ISO started recently and uh, uh, ITUT starts some analysis. Uh, 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 then uh, looking more uh, to the, uh, um, uh, let me say, America side, uh, there are some works uh, developed by companies, but uh, we found less work developed than the standard. So there are some solutions that companies are working on. In East, we try to look, but uh, uh, um, again, we think that we did something a little bit more advanced than what there is, but uh, I cannot be sure because uh, several of the, the documentation, especially in certain region are in national language. So it's very difficult <laughs> for me to retrieve all the information, but at least let, let me say, when we look around, uh, uh, let me say in that way, or what we have found, uh, in the standard environment, we try to reuse and read everything, uh, but we think that we will arrive, uh, uh, let me say, one step ahead of the others. For what we found, <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's uh, everything, because uh, I, I, at the level of standard, of course, there are company solutions which uh, start to be quite evoluted. Uh, even every, it seems that everyone is still in a starting phase. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Maro can uh, throw some light on the, the work that is being done by organizations participating in uh, SARF. Are the elevator companies also participating in uh, developing the ontologies there in SARF? Uh, because uh, when I happen to see the work being done by the major <laughs> elevator companies, uh, Thyssen Krupp and uh, Robustil and Otis for that matter, and even Kone. So I see them all working in isolation, doing their bit and creating uh, smart lifts, what they call smart lifts. So while uh, in Europe, there's a lot of standardization happening in all three standardization bodies, uh, are they also uh, participating in defining these ontologies or are they aligned with these ontologies being defined there in Sarah? In, uh, concerning only SARF or specifically for the SARF or lift domain? No, I mean, in SARF, if they are defining ontologies, uh, are they aligned to those ontologies? And uh, what other work they are doing outside SARF? So basically, <clears throat> um, within, I mean, uh, if I got correct the question, uh, in, uh, in general, I mean, the work of SAREF uh, for the core one and then also for each extension started from the analysis more from requirements rather than existing ontologies in the sense that uh, SAREF fills uh, a gap that uh, uh, there was at the European level, but not only the at the European level. Indeed, as has been presented by Enrico, there was also this... Uh, uh, this, uh, let me say, issue with the uh, one and two M based ontology, where <clears throat> was uh, was not used for, uh, um, uh, I mean, wasn't used by design for presenting a, a standard, but used more for interconnecting uh, for interconnected devices. Uh, <clears throat> in the industry sector, is aligned with uh, with Sharif in the sense that uh, within Etsy. Uh, 
we have, uh, I mean, periodic interactions with the actors coming from the industry domain uh, in order to present, I mean, when new extensions are, have been de are developed uh, and also in the past uh, when we developed uh, the uh, existing extensions for getting from them validation, feedback, and uh, um, comments in general in order to make uh, each model as much com as much compliant as possible with uh, their needs and with uh, their requirements. Okay. Uh, now, outside SARF, uh, there are not uh, um, relevant conceptual models that have been designed. Okay, so basically, it's not. I mean, we are in a situation in which uh, we don't have to align ourselves with other conceptual models. But if someone actually would like to design something uh, related to the into to the device. Uh, a part of related to start the communications, smart systems, etc., has to align themselves, themselves with us. Actually, so we uh, we built across the throughout the year. Uh, I mean, a, a, a more uh, relevant position uh, within the domain that SAF wants to address. Okay, uh, may I add one thing, uh, if I can? Um, sure. For me, it's. Uh, uh, what we have tried is to arrive to some level of alignment uh, and some level of interaction. For us, it is very important. Also, the maturity is different, especially on the semantic level. Uh, we still need the expert on semantics. It's very difficult for non-semantic experts to work on that. And we didn't get to that level of maturity. So on one side, we have the information that we identify. On the other side, we have the transformation with information in semantics. The fact that we are working at two levels, one level is the level of the information model that is in 735, which can survive even without SARF, but we want to generalize ever more semantic interworking via SARF, and that's what we are trying. We are looking for interaction with other groups, especially uh, I, 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 I learned that uh, JTC1 is working, but uh, that's still work to be done. I don't know, maybe I can ask uh, uh, related to the last two questions. I don't know if uh, uh, one of the attendees, which is Frank Russell, can provide his own view because it's uh, it, being an ELA expert and also coming from a company which is one of the bigger company, maybe as a, as a view on that. I don't know, Frank, if you want to say something or not. Uh, and if we can give the floor to, to one of the attendees. Yes, I can. So someone can activate voice for Frank Russell. Is it possible? Uh, yes, Alok, can you give him the speaker uh, connect link, please? Uh, ah, okay. We have to give him the, the speaker link. Okay. Yeah, for you know, because uh, we were uh, collaborating with the uh, ELA uh, Association in Europe, uh, and uh, that's, uh, I know that Frank has a lot of links. Ah, so thank you, Alok. <clears throat> uh, we have with us Mr. Frank Russell, please. Okay, okay yes. Uh, sorry, my camera isn't working, so I cannot show my face. I'm sorry about that. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Frank Russell. I'm part of the European Lease Association, which is a, which is a body which uh, represents also uh, many big uh, players on the European market. And uh, personally, I'm working for Schindler Elevators in Switzerland. That's my background. Um, I've been trying uh, together with uh, Enrico and uh, some other people uh, in the industry to foster and to continue the um, harmonization and standardization that uh, is allowed with Etsy. And the basic thinking which we try to push in the elevator industry is actually a very simple one, is not to reinvent the wheel ourselves and use the technical competencies in the organizations where they are located. So the elevator product itself is heavily um, standardized in the SEN organization, um, but SEN is not the um, item that has the correct or the correct background for all the telecom part and all the interoperability part. And this is why we started collaboration with Etsy and uh, 
we really, at least from the European side, the European Association is really willing to uh, collaborate with Etsy in order to focus in, on the interoperability um, of the, at least all the um, uh, legally required functions which we need to make interoperable in our sector anyway. We have one M2M, which is uh, one area that we want to focus. Uh, we also have the, like Enrico said at the beginning, the voice communication, so 3GPP style stuff, which we want to harmonize in our industry. Um, really with the intention, go into the next century with uh, up-to-date technology without reinventing the wheel and relying on the experts where the experts are located. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Frank. I can't resist myself from asking this question because Frank is from one of the largest uh, uh, lift companies of the world. Uh, so uh, in India, there would be a lot of uh, lifts which are existing, which they don't want to do away with, but want to make them smarter. How easy or difficult are uh, for them to become smart and uh, can be part of uh, the standardized ecosystem? Yeah. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very important question you're asking. And regrettably, the answer of our industry is uh, the legacy that we have to carry is huge. We have such a variety of systems out there that there is no low hanging fruit, okay? So it's going to take a lot of work to do, to make all the old stuff smart. It's not something that we can achieve in the short term. Um, this is why the standardization process in our industry is a quite a slow process because the industry needs to understand where the added value is, where the effort makes sense, because we just cannot spend our time doing everything. We just don't have enough resources in the industry. We don't have enough engineers you know, to upgrade all the old, old stuff that was out there. I mean, we are speaking about a, a legacy of electrical systems of more than 50 years, okay? And to make all these smart and all the engineers, generations of engineers who have been working on inventing different stuff is extremely difficult. And remember, we have to do it in a way that we keep the core function of the elevator, which is its safety. So it is, we need to be very, very cautious when we do changes on an existing systems, because it is out of the question that we we, we can only increase the safety level, but we shall never decrease the safety level. So all these constraints make it not so easy to do something very fast, but we need to start somewhere, okay? And this is why we started these collaborations uh, with Etsy or with other bodies uh, who have uh, added value to bring to the industry. Frank, thank you for... Uh... I mean, stepping in and thanks Enrico for introducing Frank. So I think uh, uh, we are done. We are approaching the end of the session. So over to you, Aaron. Uh, Thank you so much, Arindam ji. That was uh, extremely uh, nicely done. I must say some very good questions you have posed and many thanks to Enrico, Marco and Mauro for their excellent presentations. Um, also, a special thanks to Frank for coming forward and on request by Enrico and making a, a brief but very interesting uh, point and answering Aurundam's question too. Um, I also would like to, at this point of time, thank the uh, uh, Etsy and TSDI for their guidance and support to the project. Thank you. Thank you to all the attendees from both India and the continent and elsewhere in the world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to you for inviting. Thank, Thank you. you for inviting us. Thank you.